Dear students, I welcome you in today's lecture. Today we are going to discuss the geopolitical importance of South Asia. The main objectives of this lecture are to define South Asia as a region, understand the meaning of geopolitics, then of course I am also going to discuss the crux of the current lecture which is geopolitical importance of the South Asian region and I will conclude the lecture by talking about India within the South Asian region. Let me begin by defining South Asia as a region. South Asia is a dominion of one of the oldest civilizations where people from all races and religions have coexisted. This layering of different cultures has given it a distinctive identity that is unmatched anywhere else. The area was usually referred to as Britain's Indian Empire or Raj before 1947. Most geographers such as Sir Deadly Snap called it the Indian subcontinent because of its separation from the rest of the Asian landmass by a continuous barrier of mountains in the north. In recent years, military strategists and policy planning experts have viewed India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bhutan and Nepal as a separate region. Previously, the general tendency to lump these countries with those of the Southeast Asia. For instance, K. M. Panikar identified India with Southeast Asia and dealt with countries from India to Indonesia as a single region. Even in 1954, no distinction was made between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Pakistan became a regional member of Southeast Asia Treaty Organization along with Thailand and Philippines. Later, there was a trend to refer to Southern Asia, which included South Asia and Southeast Asia. However, now South Asia is considered a region consisting of eight countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Afghanistan was added in 2007. South Asia is also referred to as Indian subcontinent based on civilizational unity and historical continuity. The term is sometimes used more restrictively to refer to Bangladesh, India and Pakistan. According to Robert D. Kaplan, the British Raj created what in logistical terms is the subcontinent, uniting what is now India, Pakistan and Bangladesh in the late 19th century through a massive railway that stretched from the Afghan border in the northwest to Palk Strait near Sri Lanka in the deep south and from Karachi in Pakistan to Chittagong, Bangladesh. Earlier, the Mughals and the Delhi Sultanate also unified many of these areas, but through a loser system of control. However, only in 1985 did the term South Asia as a separate region get an official stamp by establishing the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, popularly known as SARC. SARC was the first formal region building initiative in South Asia in which the term South Asia became official and arguably emerged as the dominant term to define this region. Some scholars prefer to use Southern Asia which includes Iran and some other states outside the South Asian region. Several common factors override the great diversity between the countries of contemporary South Asia so that it can be marked off as a separate region. The most important factor other than the geographical factor which has contributed to its regionalization is the common influence of 200 years of British colonialism. While the Indian subcontinent 
Burma and Sri Lanka experienced direct British rule. Nepal, Sikkim and Bhutan had to surrender many of their powers to the British government in India. Consequently, we find common political, legal and administrative institutions in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. However, the British were also responsible for creating several problems in the area. Thus, some of the political differences between India and Pakistan, such as Kashmir and distribution of water resources, Sri Lanka's difference with India regarding the nationality of Tamil plantation workers and India's frictions with Myanmar and Himalayan states are legacies of the British period. Yet, despite its intra-regional intricacies, South Asia as a region has become a vital player in transnational politics. However, before discussing the geostrategic significance of South Asia, it is a site first to understand the meaning of geopolitics. So let me begin by defining the term geopolitics. Geopolitics is a framework that we can use to understand the complex world around us. Geopolitics explains how countries, businesses, terrorist groups try to reach their political goals by controlling the geographic features of the world. And we call these features geographical entities. Geographical entities are the places regions, territories, scales and networks that make up the world. Geopolitics looks at particular use of power, how countries and other groups compete to control these entities within the international community. Controlling these entities is seen to help countries and groups reach their political goals. Geopolitics is always looked at with international and global dimension, meaning that the issues are connected to the global scale. In other words, the formation of political strategies based on geopolitical facts to obtain unique political or economic benefits is called geopolitics. Thus, geopolitics can be defined as the struggle over the control of geographical entities with an international and global dimension and the use of such geographical entities for political advantage. To describe it more simply, geopolitics is about the role of geography in the conduct of a nation's international relations. The notion that geography is permanent and plays a critical role in any nation's evolution is a central theme of school of geopolitics in international relations. Now let us try to understand South Asia and its position in global politics within this context. Geopolitics of South Asia. As in other parts of the world, the geopolitics of South Asia is the result of its geography, history, global context and domestic politics. The region enjoyed considerable prominence during much of the world history. The region was home to large empires including the Maurya Empire of Ashoka and the Mughal Empire. During the British Raj, the Indian subcontinent was considered the jewel in the crown. During the Cold War, South Asia continued to have geostrategic significance for the world. After the end of the Cold War, South Asia has yet again emerged as an important region in terms of its geopolitical significance on the world stage. South Asia as a region is significant by virtue of containing nearly 30% of the global population in an area of 4.5 million square kilometers. Such a concentration of population will always be important, whatever its circumstances. However, South Asia is also important for a number of other reasons. It has a wider significance, 
politically, militarily, and of course, economically. The most important countries in the region, India and Pakistan, are nuclear powers. The region also has certain issues. It contains more of the world's poor than any other region, even sub-Saharan Africa. The 2010 United Nations Millennium Development Goals Report notes that the proportion of undernourished people in South Asia is again growing and is now on par with that of 1990. It also struggles with violent jihadi terrorism, chronic environmental problems, poor literacy rates, and a stagnant demographic transformation. South Asia is also considered one of the world's most vulnerable regions in terms of natural disasters and environmental degradation, including the growing incidence of floods, drought, cyclones, global warming, and sea level rise. The region is also known for interstate hostility, mutual mistrust, and recurrent hostilities mainly between India and Pakistan. According to Professor S. D. Muni, South Asia as a region has two characteristics. The first is that South Asia is an Indocentric region. This means that India is central to it geographically and in terms of socio, cultural and economic infrastructure of the region. Countries of the region like Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal and Pakistan have a common border with India. They are also related to India separately and individually in terms of their cultural identities, economic patterns, philosophical trends and historical experience. Conversely, there is a bit of India in every other country in South Asia including Pakistan. The result of this Indocentric nature of South Asia is that no step towards cooperation and collaboration can be taken in the region without India acquiring the central place in the scheme of things. Yet South Asia, a subsystem of the global international system, also contains vast humans and material resources. Several regional countries possess impressive political skills and military establishment to back them up. The location of the South Asia is favorable. It is well defined, defensible, and somewhat out of the line of the fire of East-West rivalry if the states within the region chooses to do so. South Asia has been most open through the Indian Ocean. For greater part of its history, the prosperity and security of the subcontinent has been as dependent on its maritime dimensions as on the continental order. Unlike the landlocked Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea, the Black Sea, or the seas near China around which other civilizations grew, the Indian Ocean is open. As a consequence of this geography, throughout history, South Asia has been an autonomous strategic unit that was also part of a larger multiverse connected but separate from the universes of Levant and the Persian Gulf, Central Asia and Persia, the Southeast Asian maritime kingdoms. The Indian Ocean is bedrock of global economic maritime activity in the 21st century. The waters in the Indian Ocean are rich in oil and minerals affecting it as an energy heartland, both in the supply and demand, hence slowly turning the drivers of global economy towards Asia. The region is of strategic importance as it bridges the Indian Ocean to the Pacific in the East and Mediterranean in the West. Furthermore, this region has emerged as a vital intersection of maritime trade, connecting the countries, producers of natural resources with the consumer states. More than two-thirds of the global oil and over 80% of the China's and Japan's oil is shipped through this region. Approximately 
50% of the global container shipments sail on these waters. This geography means that the security of South Asia is better thought of as a series of concentric but overlapping circles. What happens in Southeast Asia or East Asia or West Asia directly affects the security of South Asia and vice versa. And given the open geography of the Indian Ocean Maritime Domain, what happens in South Asia affects the rest of Asia as well. The other geopolitical consequences of the regional geography is linked to faiths and open societies within the region. Every South Asian country has cross-border ethnicities and shares deep religious and strong cultural affinities across the state boundaries. The state boundaries are new and recently defined, yet the ethnicities, languages, religions and cultures are ancient. There is a shared history of openness to each other within South Asia that is stronger than in many other regions of the world. The affinities far outweigh the political differences. You find languages, foods, religions and ethnicities crossing all the state boundaries in the South Asia. This affinity across formal state boundaries is one reason why nationalism is high but nationhood everywhere in South Asia is still a work in progress. During the Cold War and its bipolar world, most of the South Asian countries were happy to opt out of world's quarrels and alliances and concentrate on their own development. Every South Asian country was non-aligned in practice except Pakistan. For Pakistan, with an identity deficit which saw itself as gaining its independence from India, joining a great power or an alliance and seeking outside support was a way of seeking parity with a much larger India. This remains a Pakistani imperative despite fundamental changes in the international situation since the end of Cold War. For the rest of South Asia, however, changes in the international situation meant that the decades after 1990 have been the best in history for the economic development, for the growth of middle class and for their increasing integration into the world economy. India, for instance, has steadily grown its GDP at over 6% a year for the past 30 years. India is now the world's sixth largest economy in nominal GDP and her society and economy have been changed fundamentally by the reforms since 1991. In the decades of open trade and investment that followed the end of Cold War, the acceleration of growth has been broad based among the South Asian economies with Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bangladesh and others experiencing unprecedented rates of growth. Combined with the simultaneous re-emergence of powers like China, Korea, Indonesia and others and with Japan now behaving like a more normal power, geopolitics around South Asia has become much more complex. Power is much more evenly distributed in the world than it was during the Cold War and immediately thereafter. The center of gravity of the world economy and politics is now Asia Pacific. Resultantly, great power interest in South Asia has been extensively enhanced compared to what it was the during Cold War. To include its potential as a market, as a source of military power and extend us to an interest in its stability. Now let us discuss the current scenario vis-a-vis -vis the geostrategic significance of South Asia. With the resurgence of Asia, there has been a technotic shift of global attention from the west to east. Currently, the region has become a strategic battlefront among China, Russia, the United States and India scuffling to take control of it. According to some experts, minus the role of a superpower, the region 
could become a war zone between the regional powers, India and China, to take control of the South Asian region. The same could be argued about Russia playing an important role in keeping the regional nuclear capable nations from engaging in a full scale war. Washington's grip is weakening on this region as a result of its involvement in North Korea and Iran, which in turn is favoring China in carrying out its imperialistic agenda in a much more aggressive manner. The last two decades have seen a sharp incline in Chinese expansionism in the Asian continent and the South Asian region took the brunt of this changing geopolitical situation. To cover this gap left by the US, Russia seems to be flexing its muscles to play a greater role in the region. This was reflected in the recent developments in the region. First, when the ousted Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Khan, made a visit to Russia, followed by India's tilt towards Russia vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine-Russia war and the visit of Russian Foreign Minister to India in recent times. After reviewing closely the setups Russia is taking in South Asia, particularly its increasing diplomatic and military initiatives with India and the political and economic policies for Afghanistan and Bangladesh, one comes to the conclusion that Moscow is gradually heading towards achieving the position of a decisive and dominant player with enough political, military, strategic power to counter the interference of the United States in this particular region. These moves from Russia could help India in establishing its hegemony in this region, which in turn would help in bringing stability and sustainable development. U.S. involvement in this region is seldom welcomed by the majority of the South Asian countries as the U.S. does not have any territorial connection to this region. However, on the other hand, Russia is potentially the best candidate out of all global powers due to its deep strategic and defense ties with China, India, Bangladesh and several other South Asian countries. Moscow is also trying to keep Pakistan from becoming a subordinate state to China because of its increasing over-dependence on Beijing. Since India and China are the two regional giants trying to claim their respective dominance over the South Asian region, the role of the superpowers, be it the United States or Russia, still holding enormous military and diplomatic sway across the globe in maintaining peace and stability in the region and establishing a virtual buffer zone between the rival countries in the region cannot be overlooked. While China is trying to destabilize India by extending its military and diplomatic support to Pakistan, the US is playing a vital role in maintaining the peace in this region by rendering its support to New Delhi. To conclude this entire lecture, over the last 30 years, particularly after the end of Cold War, the nature and dynamics of South Asian geopolitics are undergoing a radical transformation. India has used different bilateral and multilateral strategies to pursue a regional leadership role in South Asia, and China has concentrated on bilateral relations rather than on multilateral structures. South Asia is today at an inflection point with far-reaching implications for the states in the region and for India in particular. These factors are all set to fundamentally reconfigure the geopolitics of South Asia. The rising tension between China and the US and India's increasingly US tilt foreign policy are going to determine the fate of this subcontinent. Most of the countries in South Asia are facing a dilemma of not being in a position to choose between the two global giants, the US and China. In other words, there is a Cold War-like situation between the US and China, and South Asia is the battleground. But unlike Cold War era, Europe and these South Asian nations are not clearly aligned 
either with China or with the United States of America. Rather, they are following the policy of dual phase diplomacy through which they want to draw maximum economic and military benefits from both the rival powers. The South Asian nations hold several justifiable and reasonable reservations regarding China's Belt and Road Initiative, which China has to deal with in order to win the confidence of these countries. Over the years, China has been making rapid progress in the domains of industry, economics, trade and technology, and it has achieved a level of total independence in the defense sector. Furthermore, China has started reflexing its military muscles in the several parts of the world, including South China Sea and the Indian Ocean region. Also, Beijing has directed its efforts towards the establishment and development of port infrastructure, facilities and military and naval establishments across the Indian Ocean. It has developed a chain of maritime ports and facilities right across the breadth of Indian Ocean. Beijing has signed agreements to develop maritime facilities in various countries around the Indian subcontinent, including Kenya, Sudan, Pakistan, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Malaysia. If one connects all these countries, one can establish a chain that cordons off and lays a nose around Indian subcontinent. However, as China looks towards building it on its relationships in South Asia, India has also begun to look beyond its traditional neighborhood. Its outreach towards Southeast Asia, Central Asia, as well as the wider Indo-Pacific underscores the renewed importance that New Delhi is giving to Asia and its footprints in the region. This policy has enabled India to strengthen its cultural, economic, security architecture through strategic cooperation with not only in the Southeast Asian countries, but also the Asia-Pacific member countries. These factors are all set to fundamentally reconfigure the geopolitics of South Asia in the fast-changing global order. Dear students, with this, I conclude the lecture. I hope you had enjoyed it. Thank you.